Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maximum Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. Today's session is part of our MGFC Family Centered Care Series, a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General for Children. Before I get started, just want to go over a few items with you all. Please note that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note that you're in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted, so we can hear our guest speakers today. If you have any questions for our guest speakers, you may use the chat feature, which is located at the bottom of your screen. We'll have time for in the end. Only Blum Center staff and our guest speakers will see your questions. Please do not share any personal medical information or questions in the chat. If you have a personal medical question, please ask your doctor. Lastly, at the end of today's session, you'd be directed to a brief survey, which we'd like to ask you to help us complete. Your feedback is important to us as we plan future programs. Okay, so next I would like to introduce you all to our guest speakers. Joining us today, we have Jennifer Mayetta. Jen is a speech language pathologist in the Pediatric Speech Language and Swallowing Disorders Program at Mass General for Children. She earned her master's degree in speech and language pathology from Boston University. Joining us today, we also have Emma Hill. Emma is also a speech language pathologist in the Department of Speech, Language and Swallowing Disorders and Reading Disabilities, as well as the Down Center Program at Mass General for Children. She earned her master's degree in communication sciences and disorders from Emerson College. In recognition of Better Hearing and Speech Month, they join us today to share what to expect of your child's language development as they grow. They will also share tips and tricks to help toddlers and preschoolers build their language skills and expand the vocabulary. So please join me in welcoming Jen and Emma. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to pull up our presentation. <clears throat> All right. Is that looking good? Perfect. So we just want you to note down here, we do have a QR code down in the corner. We're going to have a couple of audience participation slides. You can open it up um, by taking a picture of the QR code on your smartphone, um, or you can go to vvox.app um, and enter the session code there if you'd like to participate along with us. So we're, we're presenting today on language, speech and language development in toddlers and preschoolers and discussing ways we can help toddlers and preschoolers. Um, we're so happy to have you here today. There's so much information about communication development out there. Um, you hear it from your children's teachers, from their pediatricians, from your friends, from your mothers-in-laws. Um, and we're looking forward to spending some time with you today to confirm or maybe even refute some of the information you've heard floating around out there in the world about kids and how their language develops. So this is our session code again. Um, if anybody's having trouble opening it, please put something in the chat. It should just say um, speech and language presentation. There shouldn't be any questions on there yet. All right, so here's our agenda for today. Um, first, we're going to cover what is speech? What is language? We're going to make sure we're speaking the same language and we're all on the same page. We're going to go through communication um, milestones by age. We're going to discuss reasons for referral. Um, so what to do if maybe we're having concerns in speech and language development. We'll touch on a few hot topics um, and then we'll talk about what to do if you are concerned and we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers, hopefully. All right, so now if you can check on your smartphone or on your screen, we have a poll question open. Um, so our question for you is, let's take a look at what everyone in this meeting, everyone in this room believes about speech and language pathologists. Um, so you can select as many of these as you want. What do pediatric speech and language pathologists evaluate and treat? We'll give everyone maybe 10 more seconds to select their answers. All right, if everyone's in, I'm gonna go on so we can see what people maybe put in. All right, 
Let's look. All right, so a mixed bag. Um, the correct answer is all of these things. Um, speech and language pathologists wear many, many hats. Um, we can work with children who are not yet speaking. We can work with children who stutter or have a fluency disorder. Um, we can work with children on feeding and swallowing. Um, we can work on how they're saying sounds. So basically speech and language pathologists work on anything affecting here up. <laughs> from the lungs up to the top of the brain. Um, and adult speech and language pathologists do even more. Um, so talking and eating, <laughs> two of our favorite things. Um, so let's keep going. Before we get into developmental milestones, red flags, your questions, um, let's make sure that we are all on the same page. Um, so when we talk about speech and language, we're often talking about communication. And communication is the big, the big umbrella term. Um, and that can be broken down into different subsections. So on one side, we have language. And on one side, we have speech. Language is divided further into expressive, receptive, and social pragmatics. Expressive language is how we form sentences, how we use words, how we tell stories. This can even include gestures or nonverbal communication. So things like pointing and waving would count as expressive language. A baby who maybe uses baby sign language counts as language, even if they're not using speech. Um, there's also people who use electronic or picture-based communication systems. So something on a tablet or an app, for example, but they're not using speech to communicate, but they're still accessing language. Receptive language is how we understand questions and commands. Um, it's our comprehension of expressive language. So for most people, and especially for little kids, we understand more than we can express. And then social pragmatic language is are the rules that govern communication. Um, so kind of the unspoken rules of how we interact with other people. It might be something like, knowing not to stand too close to someone in an elevator, knowing how to take turns in a conversation or understanding non-literal language. So things like it's raining cats and dogs, um, understanding the meaning of that. On the other side, we have speech. And this is how we vocalize our expressive language. So speech sounds can also be known as articulation, is how sounds are pronounced. So a difficulty in this area is what most people may think of when they consider what a speech language pathologist job is. So fixing something like a lisp or how to say an R. Um, speech also includes voice. So the quality of our, of our vocalizations, things like a breathy or a hoarse voice or a strained voice. And uh, speech also refers to fluency, which is the forward flow of speech. So someone who stutters or someone who is disfluent um, may have a problem because they're repeating sounds or holding out sounds. They're having difficulty with speech fluency. So when we're talking about communication and little kids, we're not always talking about speech. We're not always talking about how they're saying sounds. We're talking about much more than that. So yeah. now we're going to move on. We're going to pass it off to Jen. <laughs> so that is, that brings us to communication milestones by age. We're going to go through uh, different month milestones and then in the later years, age milestones to give you an idea of expressively and receptively what we would expect from a child of each age. So for communication in six month olds, a lot of people say, what do you mean communication? They're six months old, but actually six month olds really do communicate a lot and they can show that they're understanding. Um, so we're gonna watch a very quick clip showing how a baby typically communicates at the age of six months. Jen, will you give me a quick thumbs up to make sure you can hear the sound? Yes. Vision. Your baby likes to interact with others, especially you. He hears well, can locate a sound, and is starting to imitate sounds around him. He will imitate the sounds that you make 
and this turns into a game of babbling. You will hear your child start to make consonant sounds like m or b, and then add vowel sounds like a, e, or o. You may hear him first say mama or dada, but this may not mean you at this time. At six months, your baby can express his own feelings, including joy or displeasure. By now, so welcome back. Thank you. So as I said in the video, receptively, or how the baby shows that they're understanding, is that they are moving their eyes in the direction of sounds. They're attending to things like music and your singing, um, and they're responding to tone of voice, whether it's uh, a calm and soothing voice or a not so calm and soothing voice. Expressively, or how they're having sounds and, and uh, movements coming out of them to communicate, they're doing things like vocalizing pleasure and displeasure, they're laughing, and they're babbling. And the babbling, like they said in the video, may sound like ma 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 ma, but it's not meaningful at this stage. It's all exploratory. Babbling is really good for babies because they're learning about how the different parts of their mouths and bodies work together to make sounds. So let's see how communication has developed and changed once the child is 12 months old. And do you know where this one starts? Should have been set. Um, go here. One forty. Try. Great. Emotionally, your child may be shy around strangers and may cry if you leave the room. She probably has favorite toys or clothes, and may have a preference for certain people. At the same time, your child is becoming more social. She may hand you a book when she wants to hear a story and engage in social games like peekaboo or pat a cake. Dead doggies. <laughs> mm, let's not. And a little face plan. When getting dressed, she helps by putting out. Thank you. So 12 month olds, as they mentioned in the video, start to look at familiar objects when they're named and familiar people when they're named. They may follow some uh, really simple personal commands and show understanding of their own name. And expressively, um, we start to hear more babbling with a variety of sounds in short and long groups. Um, and most kids around this age are saying one to two words consistent, consistently, usually the name of one of their caregivers. Um, and they're starting to imitate verbally. So supporting infant communication is all about watching them and being responsive. So the, the top three strategies that we talk about here directly relate to the examples down below. So the first one is respond to your baby's sounds and movements. So for example, if you're giving the baby a bath, when the baby reaches for a toy in the bathtub, uh, name the toy, talk about what they're doing, show, show them that you are responding to what they're say, what they're verbalizing or vocalizing or what they're pointing at or reaching for. Um, copy your baby's sounds. So if you are uh, giving a diaper change and the baby makes noises while having their diaper change, copy the noises back to them and engage in a back and forth uh, vo vocal play. Um, also talk about things that your baby shows interest in. Again, in the bath, if the baby reaches for the bath, it, for the bath toy, name the toy. Now we're going to move on to um, an 18 month old, 18 month olds with another poll here. So how many words should an 18 month old be saying independently? So take out your phones again and answer the question here. Is it at least one to two, at least 10 to 15, at least 30 to 40 words, or at least 50 to 75? And for anyone who may have popped in late, um the website and the code are at the top of the slide there if you want to participate in the poll. One more second. Great. So there's so much variability in language development for 18 month olds. The answer here is at least 10 to 15 words. 
Um, and this is really tricky to answer, I think, for anybody, especially who's been around a lot of 18 month olds, because you might see an 18 month old on the playground who's speaking in one to three word phrases and says over 100 words. And you also might see another 18 month old who has maybe 12 or 13 words. And your head is kind of spinning, like who's showing us normal, normal, typical language development at 18 months? So well, the answer is that they, they may both be showing typical language development at 18 months. We're looking for 10 to 15 words. And word count at 18 months is just one of the things that we look at when we evaluate an 18 month old's communication. Let's watch a little bit more about what to expect at this age. Her toddler's language and communication abilities have also improved, and she has at least 10 single words she uses consistently. She points to things to show what she wants or to show you something of interest. At this age, your child may engage in simple pretend plays such as feeding a doll or making car noises. She points out things that interest her and likes to hand you things in play. She also likes to scribble with crayons and paper. At this time, your toddler is learning a lot and knows what ordinary things are, such as a phone, a brush, and a spoon. She can point to one or two body parts. Where's baby's hand? There's baby's hand, yeah. Baby's foot, baby's foot, Maeve's foot. And she can follow one-step verbal commands, such as sit down. Wash your face. Good. Please join. So as I mentioned in the video, children at 18 months are able to point to a few body parts when you name them. The key here is make sure that you're not pointing to give them the answer to see if they truly understand what you're talking about. Um, you could have them point to the body parts on you or on a doll or on a picture in a book. Um, they should be able to follow some simple or uh, follow some simple directions and answer some simple questions and identify some some objects in pictures when you name them. Um, expressively, as we were saying before, we are looking for 10 to 15 words minimum. Some common words for children at this age are uh, parent and caregiver names, pet names, uh, words that help them to advocate for themselves like no, mine, milk or water, banana, um, words that are social words like hi and bye. Um, and when we're talking about these 10 to 15 words, we're looking for words that are consistent, independent, and meaningful. It's okay if they're not produced, produced correctly at this stage, as long as they are consistent, independent, and meaningful. Um, and we're looking for children at this age to also be using a variety of different gestures, including waving, clapping, and pointing. As the child reaches age two, communication changes a lot. Let's see how. Your child's communication has grown and she is able to point to objects when they are named. What did you see? I think it hurt. She knows the names of familiar people and has a vocabulary of at least 50 words. Your child is using two to four word sentences to ask you for things, tell you something, or voice complaints. By now, you should understand at least half of what your child says. Your child can follow simple two-step instructions such as, please pick up your shoes and give them to me. Can you take off your socks and give them to me? Okay. Okay. She can also identify many body parts and pieces of clothing. At 24 months, your child can stand on. I will say that child is quite compliant. Uh, so at age 24 months, uh, like I said in the video, you, we would expect a child to be following some two-part directions, again, without gesture cues, meaning without you pointing and gesturing what the child should do with the object. Um, I, we would expect them to point to some actions and pictures when you name them, like who's sleeping or who's running. Um, and expressively, we are looking for at least 50 words and starting to put two words together. Um, the vocabulary can even go up to, can be anywhere between 50 and 200 to 300 words at this stage, but a minimum of 50. Um, and two words together, uh, something to note is that a word like thank you only counts as one word technically, because the child only thinks of it as one word. 
Um, but if they were to say something like, thank you, dad, dad, that definitely counts as two words. Some other early common two word combinations are things like, hi, mama, more milk, or no night night. Um, and at this age, a child should be about 50% intelligible, meaning 50% clear to an unfamiliar listener. And we have another poll here. True or false? A child should know most letters and colors by age two. Waiting on just a couple more responses and then we'll move on. Maybe 10 more seconds. All right, let's see what everyone said. Well, the, the group got it. This is uh, false. The children's toy market really wants caregivers to think that children should know letters, numbers, colors, shapes at this young age, but it's honestly not necessary. Saying the color blue or the letter A doesn't really help children communicate what they're thinking or feeling or what they need. At this age, we really want to focus on words that help children communicate their wants, needs, feelings, and to share enjoyment with others. Helping your toddler learn language is all about continuing to watch and be responsive, which we talked about in the infant section, and also setting up opportunities for them to learn and use new words. For the add one word strategy, a concrete example might be that if you're playing and the child signs or says car, you would sign or say back, sign and say back, more cars. Uh, another strategy is to give choices. Instead of asking, do you want questions, like do you want a banana, which will just get at you a yes or no, you could give an, a choice. Do you want a banana or strawberries? And lastly, a fill in the blank strategy. This is actually one of my favorites to use with my toddler. Uh, when singing or reading a favorite book that you've read a thousand times, leave off the last word in the phrase or a sentence and pause for them to fill it in. If they don't fill it in right away, that's okay. Wait a couple of seconds and then say the word, model it for them, and maybe try again another time. Right, so now we're moving into the preschool age, three years old and up. Um, so we're gonna take a look at some things that your three-year-old might be doing in terms of communication at this age. Your child's language has improved and it can be understood by strangers most of the time. I need key. Oh, the keys are put away. He can name most familiar objects, including friends, and can say his name, age, and gender. What's your name? Um, the child understands words like in, on, and under. Can't go under. Can't go under. Okay. Would he get an owie if you go under? Uh -huh. In conversation, your child says words like I, me, we, and you, and is using two to three sentences at a time. <laughs> Motor skills are. Great. So the big things we're looking at receptively around three years old is that your child is going to start following longer and more complicated directions, again, without any clues or without any support. So a multi-step direction might be something like, put away the book, put on your jacket and go line up. You know, something that they might hear in school or in preschool. They're gonna start learning early concepts. So some, we call them quantity concepts, like some, all, or none. So saying, give me all of the blocks or give me some of the blocks. And they're gonna to start to answer WH questions. So simple questions like who, what, what are they doing and where? So like, what do you need to wear when it's raining? Or what is the doggy doing? Expressively, we're really going to start to see the emergence of sentences. So putting three to four words together at least to make a little sentence. And they're going to start using early grammar. So things like plurals, shoe versus shoes, pronouns like I, you, they. Um, so instead of saying John's ball, saying my ball um, and ing verbs. So instead of saying he jump, saying he's jumping. So sounding a little bit more adult-like, but not perfect yet. And at this point, their speech should be around 75% intelligible. 
so clear most of the time, but maybe not all of the time. Um, when they're speaking in sentences, their word order should be generally accurate, but maybe they're missing small words or they're using some things incorrectly. So maybe like, I have two foots instead of I have two feet. That would still be very normal at this age. All right, looking at some of our four-year-old friends. So we're still in the preschool age. Kids are still developing very, very rapidly at this time. But a four-year-old, we're thinking they're gonna start moving out of preschool, looking, looking forwards towards kindergarten. Um, receptively, they are going to know a ton of words. A four-year-old should actually understand around 3,000 words. So think about that. You can't teach your child 3,000 words one at a time using flashcards. Your child is really absorbing these from the environment around them. And they're going to start to learn um, more advanced vocabulary. So things like branch and twig and leaves rather than just tree. Um, they're going to start to learn more complex concepts. So time words like before and after, yesterday. So you can say, what did you do before school? What are you going to do after snack? Um, they'll learn emotion words, frustrated, happy, angry, and then things we call mental state words. So words about thinking, um, forget, I forgot my backpack. Um, I wonder, I wonder what's going to happen next. Um, and they're going to start use, following even longer, less familiar multi-step directions. So whereas a three-year-old may follow familiar multi-part directions, things about routines or things they do every day, a four-year-old may, um, you know, you could say, touch your nose, go give mommy a high five and grab the red book off of the floor. So something completely random they should be able to hold in their head and follow without clues. Um, expressively, they're going to keep using those sentences and link them together to start telling stories um, and beginning to use complex sentences. So longer sentences with words like because or and. Um, I'm going to get a snack because I'm hungry, something like that. And telling stories. Um, today at school, Jenny fell down and hurt her knee. Then she had to go to the nurse, something like that. And again, the vocabulary is going to get a lot more specific. Um, so your child, at this age, your child's going to come out with words and you're going to think, how did she learn that word? Where did that come from? And at this point, at four, year old, four years old, your child's speech should be around 100% intelligible, but not perfect. You're going to be able to understand everything they say, even if they may be making um, errors with individual sounds. So let's talk about ways to help your preschooler, so your three and four-year-olds learn language. Again, going back to infants and toddlers, it's all about engagement and interaction and being responsive to your child. Um, one of the things you can do is talk about how and why things work. So for example, if you're driving in the car and your child says, why did we stop? And at this age, your child might be asking a lot of why, why, why questions. Talk about it. Describe why we have traffic lights and why we stop at red. That's going to help them learn more, co uh, more complex concepts in language. Um, other things like sorting things into categories. So if you're getting home from the grocery store, have your child sort the groceries into fruits and veggies when you get home. Um, that's going to give you an opportunity to talk about some more complex things and help your child think at a higher level. Start to sequence events. Sequencing events is really important for telling stories. Um, it can also help your child um, ex know what to expect during the day and regulate themselves. So if you're eating breakfast, review the events of the day. You know, oh, we're going to eat breakfast, then we're going to get in the car and drive to school. And after school, we're going to have a play date. Um, and then we'll have dinner, something like that. First, next, then last. And always, always, always read daily and play pretend. Um, these are simple things you can build into your day to day routine that are really going to help your child, especially developing some early literacy skills at this age.
All right, so let's talk quickly. We're gonna shift into talking about reasons for referral. So these are reasons why you may wanna seek out advice from a speech and language pathologist or another professional. And we're gonna go through according to age group. So looking at our birth to two-year-olds, so our infants and our toddlers, um, some reasons you may wanna consult a professional include not, not engaging socially with others, maybe not smiling or not interacting as much with others as we would expect. Um, not using gestures by around one years old. So gestures like pointing, waving, those are things we want to see come out by one year old. If they're not doing that, we may want to look into it a little bit more. Um, making sounds. So between you know, six to 12 months, we should be hearing lots of sound play and babbling, um, making different silly sounds with their mouths. If you're not hearing a lot of babbling or sounds, that might be a reason to refer. Um, also around one, um, one to one and a half years old, one to two years old, um, at that point, we do wanna see children starting to use spoken words or starting to use sign language. If we're not seeing spoken words or sign language at that point, you may want to request a referral. Also, if they're not understanding simple things. Um, so at this age, simple directions. Um, give me a high five. Go get your ball. Um, that might be a reason for referral for an infant or not an infant at that point, but a toddler. Now looking more into this toddler age are two to three year olds. Some reasons you might wanna request a referral include not starting to put words together. Around two years old is when we expect kids to start linking at least two words and then growing in length until they're three. Not playing pretend with, um, not playing pretend, so like playing kitchen, taking care of a baby doll, acting out little scenes with cars or action figurines. Um, Difficulty with answering simple questions. So things like, what is this? Where is mommy? What do you want to eat? Difficulty producing the k, g, t, or d sounds. So the k, g, f, t, or d sounds. Um, those sounds should be coming in around three years old. So that could be if your child is saying t, t, for cookie when they're three, that might be a reason for referral. Um, or around three years old, um, having speech that's very unclear to familiar people. Again, at three, it may not be completely understandable to everyone, but a familiar adult should understand most of what their child is saying at three years old. For the three to five-year-old age range, so our preschooler kids, some reasons you might want to request, request a referral include not making sentences yet. So at three years old, we expect simple, clear sentences and then getting closer to five years, five years old, more complex, longer sentences. Having difficulty playing or interacting with other children. So around four to five, we expect to see kids playing pretend together, playing house, things like that. Trouble following multi-step directions. So if you say, go get your shoes and come here and sit down at the kitchen table, but they only get part of the direction right or they seem to ignore you. That might be a reason to have them assessed. Um, around Again, starting to tell simple stories. So if your child isn't telling simple stories, repeating a story from a book or a movie or talking about their day um, and not saying most sounds correctly by five to six years. Um, not every single sound is gonna be correct, but by the time they're at the end of five, they're a late five-year-old, almost six, they should be saying most sounds correctly and should be 100% intelligible. All right, passing over to you, Jen. We're going to shift into some hot topics. Uh, we'll do a slide or two on each of these and we do provide the sources at the bottom in case you wanna do some further digging into any of these hot topics. Pandemic babies. Uh, a lot, a lot common I hear a lot is, oh, my friend's kids are all delayed because they're all pandemic babies. But is this true? So I have a pandemic baby myself. So I have a special interest in this topic. Um, the, 
the best research that I've been able to come across at this point is um, a meta-analysis that was completed in 2022. And of course, the research is still evolving in this area. Um, the meta-analysis where they combined the data from a bunch of independent studies to determine overall trends found that there was no overall increased risk of global developmental delay. There was some evidence for delayed communication and social skills, but there was significant variation in the outcomes. Some children really thrived during the pandemic, while others were really severely impacted. Um, and of course, we don't know the exact reasons for every single child in, in, the, um, in the studies. Um, the study looked at over 11,000 infants born during the pandemic and almost 10,000 born beforehand. Um, but some potential reasons that the different authors gave were things like parent and caregiver mental health, which really suffered during the pandemic, reduced access to childcare, healthcare, school, which also limited access to things like early identification of speech and language delays and speech therapy, um, job and income loss, and um, loss of routines and structure and quality caregiver and child time. Children really thrive on routine and structure and the pandemic made this really difficult. Um, overall, the takeaway that I found from this was it's really important to focus now on some of the things that were really hard to achieve during the most challenging times of the pandemic, things like nurturing caregiver and child relationships, providing ample opportunities for free play and exploration, focusing on reducing um, caregiver stress as much as possible and giving as much caregiver support as we can, and of course, referral to SLP when necessary. All right, we have another uh, question here for you. Is it better for a child to attend child care or to be cared for by a family member? So go ahead and put in your answers. All right, I'm gonna move on. The answer in our field is always it's much more nuanced than this, I think, um, and that is true. So family members are frequently asking if their child is experiencing language delay because they attend child care and also because they don't attend child care. Um, the NICHD study of early child care and development is the largest and most comprehensive study of the impact of child care on child development to date. They followed a thousand children up to age 18 who'd been cared for in different child care arrangements. And they found that there were positive and negative impacts of each child care arrangement, but all of the impacts were relatively minor. Um, what they found is that really what matters the most is the actual environment that the child is in, whether it's at home or in group child care. So we're looking for things that are like the environment is safe with attuned caregivers who care about the child and who set developmentally appropriate limits. It's an environment that's cognitively stimulating with limited media consumption, like not sitting in front of the TV or iPad all day. Um, we want access to developmentally appropriate books and toys. And most importantly, when the child isn't cared for during the day at childcare or wherever they are, when they're with their, with their primary caregivers or parents, that they are having high quality caregiver and child interactions. All right, another poll here. By what age do most English speaking children say the English R sound? Got two to three, four and a half to five and a half, seven to eight. This is a really common question that people ask when they find out what we do for work. About 10 more seconds. All right, let's see what everyone said. Oh, wow. Yes. So the answer is four and a half to five and a half. Uh, we used to, even within the last, you know, 10 years, we used to say, oh, we don't need to work on that until a child, on the R sound until a child is seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, but recent research has shown that actually the majority of kids are saying this, the R sound by five and a half, 90 to hundred percent of children are saying the R sound by five and a half. So if your child is approaching five and a half and isn't saying the sound correctly yet, refer them on over to us. If the child is seven, eight, nine or older, don't fear, it's never too late. Um, we're still happy to see them. 
A few more tidbits about speech sound disorders, such as difficulty producing the R sound. Um, all disorders of sound production fall under the umbrella of speech sound disorders. Some people might call this pronunciation or enunciation or articulation. They often don't have a known cause. Um, something that's really important to note is that they cannot be fixed with mouth strengthening exercises. Uh, we gotta work on speech in order to improve speech. Speaking with an accent is not a speech sound disorder, it's just a difference. And what about tongue tie? There's a lot out in the ether, especially on social media about tongue tie, which is when the band of tissue connecting the bottom of the tongue to the floor of the mouth seems short. Tongue tie as a cause of speech sound disorder has very poor and inconsistent evidence. Um, a 2020 consensus paper by the American Academy of Otolaryngology had neck surgery really strongly recommends that um, consultation with a speech language pathologist be considered before um, having a phrenotomy, which is clipping of the tongue tie, that, that band beneath the tongue. Um, and the reason for that is because while it may seem reasonable that the tongue tie is the cause of the speech sound disorder, it's often unrelated. All right, so another really, really hot topic that I'm sure everyone has heard tons about is screen media screen time um, for kids. And you hear different things from your pediatrician, from your family, from your friends. Um, and there's actually, it's like everything, very nuanced. Um, and by screen media, we mean anything they may watch or interact with on a TV, a phone, or a tablet, like video games, um, educational videos, apps. Um, Several large meta-analyses, so big studies, have shown that screen media, even educational media, is not an effective way to teach young children. So these children under five, they're just not going to learn a lot from it. Um, there's also some evidence that in -screen, increased screen time in children is correlated with poor language, behavioral, and academic skills later. But again, the, ev the evidence is correlational, not causal. Um, so we see kids with higher screen time often have poorer language and academic scores, but we're not positive screen time is, is the cause of that. But we do know that screens are not a great way to teach language. Um, to teach language, it really has to be interactive. It has to be between two real people. But that said, there's not a lot of evidence that exposure to limited amounts of high quality media, so things like Sesame Street, is going to cause harm. So it's not going to help your child really learn language, but a little bit here and there, you know, the 20 minutes while you're trying to cook dinner, the half an hour when they're sick, that's not going to cause any long-term damage as long as the rest of their time is spent in high quality language rich environments with responsive caregivers. Sometimes it'll seem like your child may learn something from a screen, like they're going to repeat sounds that Miss Rachel said. But it's a more, that's more rote memorization. They've memorized and they're repeating it. They're typically not able then to apply it functionally in other contexts. Um, and it's always best to use if it's watched or used with an adult there to help moderate. So basically don't feel guilty about occasionally giving your kids some high quality media, um, but try to keep it to a minimum is what we say. Okay, quick other poll. People wanna open it up. Does hearing two or more languages cause language delays? Yes or no? This is also a very, very common question that we get. All right, people responded to this quickly. Let's see what people said. Hooray! Good job, everyone. The answer is no. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. There is zero evidence that learning more than one language causes language delays. Um, it's actually the norm around the world for children to learn multiple languages. Um, language learning depends on input, um, and it's going to look different based on context, um, based on how much of each language they're hearing, who they are hearing it from, in what settings they're hearing it in. Um, but even for children who have a disability or children who have a language delay, um, hearing two languages is not going to worsen the situation, and it can be hugely important for social interaction. Um, if you want more information on this, there's a presentation next Tuesday at the Blum Center with one of our colleagues, Jacqueline. So we highly recommend you check that out.
So should you switch to English only if your child has a language delay and you live in the US? No, absolutely not. Do not switch to only one language. Um, on At the end of the day, it's very personal. It's your family's choice, but it's not going to help to just switch to one language. So some take home tips. Um, the most important things you can do for young language learners are to play, read, talk, and have fun. It's all about engaged um, interactions with loving caregivers. Educational toys, flashcards, educational apps, they can be incorporated into play, but they're not going to teach your child language in and of themselves. So oftentimes the toys with the fewest bells and whistles, thanks blocks, dolls, dollhouses, kitchen sets, are going to be the best. Uh, language has to be learned in interactions with other people. All right, so what do you do if you are concerned? Contact your pediatrician. Um, we want to request a hearing test to make sure your child's hearing is adequate. We need adequate access to sound to learn spoken language and request a referral to a speech and language pathologist. You can, refer, you can request a referral to Mass General or to an SLP in your community. There are speech language pathologists all over the state and all over the countries. If your child is under three years old, they can go to early intervention, which is a home visiting program. Um, it's free through the state of Massachusetts. The website is below. If your child is over two years and nine months, you can even contact your local public school system and request a speech and language evaluation. And they may be able to access speech and language therapy through their local public schools. Here are our resources and our references. And I will stop our screen share to make sure we have some time to answer questions. Thank you so much for a helpful presentation. These are all extremely helpful. We are now at the end of the session. So if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat. So we have a question about guidelines. When the guidelines say by two or three years old, is it right when they turn two or three or does throughout the year count? And do you want to take this or should I? Um, I think I need clarification if uh, Amanda can clarify in the chat if she means the guidelines that we noted or guidelines like, for example, the CDC guidelines. Um, generally for the guidelines we noted. Okay, thank you. Um, so the age ranges, if it says like two or two to three years old, it means between the age of like 24 months and 36 months generally through our, throughout our um, presentation here. So like reasons for referral, two to three years old, it should be, it's like between 24 and 36 months. Thank you. Are there any specific games you can recommend that helps develop language for two to three year olds? So many. Um, I, so if we want a specific game, I love a game like hide and seek, and it can be a modified hide and seek where you're not really playing, uh, but you to give your child directions to go hide things around the home um, or to go find things around the home. Um, that can be very fun. So go put the ball under the couch or where did you put the bear or games like I spy if they're a little bit older and can understand it. Um, so, you know, I spy something simple. I spy a dog. Can you find the dog? And looking around there as you're walking around the neighborhood or driving or taking the train. Jen, any others? Those are great. <laughs> Do you have any store-bought games where you would recommend? I would say not really at this age, between like 24 and 36 months. I, we really focus a lot on playing with toys and reading books, um, doing puzzles is great. Um, and really people games, that's getting at that interaction and that responsiveness that's really important for language learning. And what are your thoughts on video 
programs such as Ms. Rachel in terms of quality compared to other programs such as Cocomelon? Is it just as bad? Are they better? Is it okay? So this is mom Jen talking. I like Miss Rachel. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, my kid gets 10, 15 minutes of screen time and all she watches is Miss Rachel. So um, that's that take that for what it's worth. Um, but as Emma said, you know, it, it's not like 30 minutes mm -hmm. of cocoa melon is going to be harmful based on what the research is showing us. So I would say choose something that if you're if you're using screen time as a tool, choose something that you feel good about. Um, I feel good about Miss Rachel and the models that she's giving, the language that she's using, and the songs that she's singing and things like that. Um, so you kind of have to go with your parenting gut on this one. And I like Miss Rachel. Yeah, some of the strategies they recommend for high quality children's content are things like slow rate of speech, so speaking very slowly lots of pauses to give your child time to potentially respond or to process what was said and lots of um, visual or gestural supports. So those are all things you do see in Miss Rachel. Thank you. How common is it for three-year-olds to confuse pronouns such as I and you when they're calling themselves you? Emma. Around three, I would expect to see that starting, you know, the three to four range starting to reduce. Um, I think there can be some pronoun confusion as children are learning them. Um, but around three to four is when we start to see that early grammar emerging. Um, so I would want to see that starting to fade away kind of naturally. But we do see kids make errors with pronouns, certainly when they're learning pronouns. Thank you. And what are your thoughts on sign language? Is sign language helpful for all toddlers or just ones with an expressive verbal delay? Do sign language count as words? Great question. Signs do count as words, certainly. Um, we, we don't know which children are going to have an early expressive language delay. so. There's no harm in introducing signs to all children. And then the children who start to produce lots of spoken words will naturally stop using the signs um, as they become more verbal communicators. So it's helpful, it's not harmful. And the ones who need it the most, the ones who do wind up having expressive verbal delays um, will most likely retain the signs and help them communicate and reduce their frustration with communication over time. Thank you. We have a participant who has a two and a half year old. Their child is saying dar for car or noon for moon. Is this something that they should be concerned about? I would say it would depend on if this is a one-off or if these are um, patterns that are persistent and if these are the only patterns or if there are lots of patterns that have um, that are in error, a lot of error patterns noted in the child's speech. So at two and a half, I would say it wouldn't hurt to at least have an evaluation and see if there are additional patterns to, to be noted and see if there's anything else that's going on that we um, should take a look at and work on. Thank you. We have a grandparent question. This participant has a two-year-old granddaughter who seems very behind in speech. She's going to a speech therapist, but this grandparent is very concerned that the family is not realizing how seriously behind she is. Should she say something or not? Well, I think the, the encouraging thing is that they are receiving speech therapy. So, there may not be something else that the child, that that anything else the child might need at that point, if they're already getting some support. Um, without having more information about the child or about the family, it's hard to say because it is, it's so personal within families. Um, Jen, do you have anything else to add? That's I'm exactly what I would say. It's encouraging to hear that they are getting speech therapy already. 
And sometimes the progress in speech therapy can be gradual. Um, so I also wouldn't be frustrated if it seems like they've been in speech for a few months and you're not seeing enormous leaps. Sometimes they need time. Thank you. Is there any connection between language development and reading books to your child? Reading books is fantastic for your child. <laughs> um, I don't have data or studies off the top of my head, um, but it's nothing if not advantageous to begin reading books early with your child. Um, it sets up a great routine, um, great behaviors for later literacy development, you know, more kindergarten, first grade age when we really expect them to start reading. Um, but one thing that books do are expose your child to a greater variety of vocabulary that they may not see in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so it can help expand their vocabulary. Um, so while I don't have a study off the top of my head that says like, yes, there's a direct link, um, we always advocate for establishing a reading routine as early as possible. Thank you. And while we wait to see if there are any final questions in the chat, do you have any thoughts you'd like to share with the audience? This has been wonderful. Thank you for inviting us to talk here and share about our field and ways that uh, grandparents and parents and, and everybody who's involved here can support the little ones in their lives. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. As I mentioned, today's session is being recorded. If you're interested in viewing the recording, you may visit the Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you so much.